Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is by way of repetition. <clears throat> but it will be repeated many, many times because in this work that has been done since the return from the mainland, <clears throat> you will find not, all, not only that all of the principles, every facet of the principle of the infinite way will be found in this series of tapes, but also that the steps necessary to the development and unfoldment of the higher consciousness are also embodied in these tapes. But whereas the letter of truth, that is the various principles or facets of the one principle may be learned by reading them over and over or hearing them over and over, <clears throat> the development and the unfoldment of the higher consciousness cannot be attained in that way. This can only be attained <clears throat> by an actual practice. Yes, <clears throat> it may happen that an individual here and there will receive the illumination by grace. It can come while we are here in meditation or while I'm speaking to you. Just the mere fact of your having tuned into my consciousness may bring to you uh, that grace which is in itself the opening out of the uh, Christ consciousness in you. <clears throat> but that will not take place with everyone. There are some who will have to practice diligently until it is attained. It is the same with those who are hearing this on the recordings <clears throat> Some who are listening to these tapes may receive it right while they're listening or at night after they've gone home and thought over something that they've heard because the consciousness accompanies this work wherever it goes. But again, this will not happen to all those who hear the tapes. Human consciousness is not so evolved that everyone can receive it in the same way. And so there are some who will have to practice the uh, meditations and communion until the light itself breaks within them. Now, <clears throat> let me explain this point about the Christ or spiritual consciousness. Those of you who read Bertrand Russell's article in uh, last Saturday's Star Bulletin on agnosticism are aware of how much factual knowledge was included in there regarding uh, the fallacy of the belief that church religion is really religion and uh, has ever done much for the world of a constructive nature. As he said, the church has done more of a destructive nature in the world than it has ever done of a constructive nature. Mm. That is virtually true. There have probably been more people killed and destroyed by order of the church than have ever been spiritually saved by them. Now, and that will be taken care of in uh, the one and only way in which it can be solved. Uh, Russia does not have the right answer 
in uh, forbidding religion or destroying churches? The correct answer is the evolution and spiritual development of human consciousness. Because whatever improvement is to take place in our human experience, individually or collectively, must take place through a transformation of consciousness, not through a violent external explosion. It is very much like the Civil War in the United States, which was supposed to have freed the Negroes. But when I started traveling the South in 1911, I found very few evidences of any uh, freed Negroes, very few evidences of it. And uh, whatever measure of freedom they have attained in the intervening years has not been because of the Civil War. It has been because of a change in human consciousness which is more ready to accept that men are equal at birth. Not that they remain equal throughout their lives because there is no way for them to do that. One man will take advantage of his opportunities uh, and another won't. One man will uh, evolve and uh, take advantage of the higher and better things that the world offers today and others will remain in their old uh, ignorance and evil. But basically, and underneath the skin, so far as consciousness is concerned, uh, we are equal whether we're white or black, oriental or occidental, Jew or Gentile, Mohammedan or Hindu. And uh, no one can force that equality upon the world. That has to come through enlightenment. Those who have traveled most in the world are the most liberal in their thought toward other races and religions, colors, and creeds. Now, <clears throat> When Mr. Russell finishes condemning the church, he leaves his article right there at the standpoint of condemnation because he has no answer beyond that. He merely knows that what the church has done or is doing is in the main wrong, but he has no way of telling you what is right because he doesn't believe in God himself. So his answer could only be to stop the churches doing what they are doing and then leave us in, sublime, in the sublime ignorance which he acknowledges he himself is in. Of course, this you understand comes for only one reason. Mr. Russell and all the agnostics and atheists like him may have very good minds very good reasoning ability. And they can read and analyze and study. And uh, when they reach that limit, they have reached their limit because they know nothing about a transcendental mind. They know nothing about the mind that was in Christ Jesus. They know nothing about a state of consciousness that transcends ordinary human knowledge. It is just as if there could be a group like us who had never heard of music and had never heard music and then could become absolutely convinced that there is no music and could be no music and the proof of it would well be that when we heard music, we say, see that? Just a lot of noises. And so it is that when you show forth an evidence to an agnostic or an atheist of spiritual power, they say it's just an accident. Now, <clears throat> we 
have risen a step above that intellectual uh, knowledge of what is right or wrong in that even before we attain an actual experience of the Christ we know there is such a thing to be attained something within us has already said uh, there is something more than what the eye beholds something within us has already said to us there is something that the eye does not see that the ear does not hear in other words we say there must be a God there is a God and even if we have not attained the experience of God we at least have an inner conviction that is not based on knowledge it is not based on intellectual perception or reasoning or thinking it is based on something that has been called the still small voice which assures us that even without plunging our hand into uh, Jesus side we know that there is a resurrection now the step beyond knowing this is experiencing it and so we come to this point of either receiving by grace an illumination that brings us into the awareness and experience of Christ or we faithfully practice until that attainment is achieved now the practice consists of something along this line <coughs> let us agree that we have in this room 12 or 15 or 20 people and uh, that the resources in this room will be let's say the financial resources will be the sum total of uh, the resources of each one of us individually and then we'll total it all up and say well there's three hundred dollars in this room so then the resources economically speaking in this room are three hundred dollars and now let us say then how much physical strength is there and so we will each punch one of those bags and find that we average 150 pounds of punching power multiplied by 20 and so we have 3,000 pounds of punching power in this room and so we can go on and arrive at the physical economical and by virtue of IQ tests we can even arrive at the mental uh, force or power that there is in this room and so far as our friends are concerned that really tells the story however we could easily find ourselves in trouble because if a headache develops there is no aspirin in this room well now that's where we can illustrate this point there isn't anyone here who doesn't know that there is something in this room that is invisible that could take care of that headache situation do you see that think of that now everyone in this room knows that even without an aspirin tablet that there is something in this room that can take care of that situation and now can you not imagine our agnostic and atheist friend saying show it to me and you say no I'm sorry I can't oh, you can't show it to me if you can't let me see it or hear it or taste it or touch it or smell it I can't believe it and yet we know that it is here we know that in the same way we know that if each one of us came to this room without funds 
and that if it were meal time, that there is something in this room that would set a table for us. We know that there is something in this room that whether or not we're convinced of our ability to bring it forth, we at least know that there is something in this room that would meet every human need for us. We know that there is enough understanding of it in this room to meet most things with it quickly. Now, we know further that that thing that is in this room isn't in a room, it's in consciousness. But it's not merely in a word called consciousness, actually it is in my individual consciousness. And it is in your individual consciousness. Everyone in this room is aware of the fact, and everyone listening to these tapes is aware of the fact that within their own being, closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet, is Christ consciousness a spiritual presence and a spiritual power which can set a table in the wilderness, which can heal the sick, reform the sinner, raise the dead, feed the hungry. There is that presence and there is that power and it is here within you and it is here within me. Now, in some measure, you have seen it operate in my consciousness and with some of you, I have seen it operate in your consciousness in some measure. Not sufficient, but at least sufficient to prove that it is there, that it is available, and uh, because of this, it can be brought into instantaneous and complete manifestation and uh, evidence. Now then, here is a statement of a transcendental nature because it is a statement of something that cannot be proved by any evidence of the senses. You might say, oh yes, if I experience a healing that will be proof. Not necessarily. Scripture says if you raise them from the dead, they would not believe. And I have actually seen that in my life, not once, but hundreds of times, where healings have taken place and somebody says, well, how do you know it wouldn't have taken place uh, anyhow? And Then there are all these other natural ways that it could have come about. So that there is no way ever of convincing you or anybody else through the mind that there is a spiritual power or that you have seen it at work. There is, of course, the same inner awareness that tells you when you have experienced God in action, when you have experienced a spiritual healing. All so-called spiritual healings are not spiritual healings. In other words, the mere fact that you have turned to God or turned to a practitioner or teacher and received a healing does not in and of itself mean that a spiritual healing has taken place. Always remember this, that there are sometimes when you turn to spiritual help and nature just beats you to it and heals it up before you have any chance to realize your God consciousness. Many times there are people turn for metaphysical help and eventually get over a cold or grip or flu or something else and uh, do not realize that nature in its own way has taken care of the situation without any help from the spirit. But you yourself can't be fooled. You know when the Spirit has touched you. Often you know the very second when the contact was made. 
you feel the healing in some way that a natural healing or a healing of nature never can reveal. Now, our major point at this moment is this, that we seem to be a group of people in a room, that actually everyone in this room knows that there is an invisible presence and an invisible power here with us and that it is located in each case closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet within you, within me. It is not out here in the middle of the room. Even though there may be an atmosphere of peace in the room, that is only the effect the presence that caused it is within you, within the individual being. It may well be that you can touch the hem of a robe and get healed, but that is not because the healing power is in the robe. The healing power is in an individual consciousness, but in coming out like the perfume comes out of a flower, it may permeate the robe. Now, our lives on the spiritual path are lived by the grace of this invisible presence and power. We are no longer looking to person, to thing, to circumstance or condition for our good. We are accepting it through whatever avenue, means or channels this spirit may provide but we are looking to the source which is the kingdom of God the invisible presence and power within ourselves now picture this room with me coming into it in the morning after arising and making the physical preparations of the day and being in this room and saying, yes, Joel, here you are. But you are not enough. There must be something more in evidence in this room. And then sitting down in silence, in quietness, until that invisible presence and power announces itself in some way and lets me know that I am not in this room alone, that its presence will go before me and be with me in every experience during the day, that it will meet every demand that is made upon me. He performeth that which is given me to do. But supposing there were no he, then I would be called upon personally through wisdom, knowledge, or strength to do things which I could never do. Now, the moment I attain that inner realization of the presence, from that moment on, if a headache comes into this room, it should be dispelled. It should be dispelled by reason of the realization of the activity of the Christ. Remember, the activity of the Christ was omnipresent even if Bertrand Russell had been here. But it would have been of no avail because of a lack of realization. It is the realization that brings it into active manifestation. Remember that on that ship with the Master, where there was this violent storm, so violent that they had to awaken him out of sleep. Remember that the Christ was there, but of no avail until they awakened the Master and brought his conscious realization into the scene. Remember that when the centurion came to the Master and asked that his servant be healed, remember that the Christ was right where the centurion was and right where the servant was but of no avail 
until they came to the master for the conscious realization of the activity and presence of the Christ. Do you see that? Never forget that this Christ is universal presence and power even in hell, even in the valley of the shadow of death, even on the crucifix. But this Christ, this transcendental presence and power, this spiritual illumination, which is the all presence and all power in the world, this is only available to us in proportion to a conscious recognition and realization of it. The first step we have all attained, that is the recognition that there is something invisible in this room sufficient to meet every need. The next step is the realization of it. Now, the function of a teacher, which will be your function as you go out in life, whether or not as a recognized teacher or an invisible one is not important. But the function is, first of all, to reveal this principle. Second, wherever there is a degree of receptivity, to bring it into conscious expression. So is your function. First of all, you cannot function on a spiritual plane until you have attained that experience. Yes, you can be an instrument to lead others to it through the spoken or written word, but actually to function in the fourth dimension, you should be functioning there in your own life in order to be able to help others to function there in theirs. And to function in the fourth dimension means to have available to you that which you know is now within your own being, the Christ. Just as you can count up how many dollars you have, just as you can count up how much physical strength you have, so you should be able to say, ah, oh, yes, but I still have something greater than all these, and that is this infinite invisible, which is the source of these others and the multiplier and the maintainer, and the sustainer, as well as the original creator. Now, every day, many times a day, all those who are part of this work through being in this room or being a part of the tape work must realize this truth that it isn't sufficient to be Joel or Bill or Mary unless you can bring into active expression this invisible center of your being until you can bring yourself to that point where it speaks to you, where it voices itself or utters itself or reveals itself in some way, you are not yet functioning in the fourth dimension. The fourth dimension gives you access to the infinity of God. It gives access to the whole ocean of supply, economic, health, moral, intellectual, the whole sea of God is available, the whole sea of spirit is available, and all the resources in the fourth dimension of life, but that fourth dimension of life is the point that these agnostics, philosophers, and most religionists know nothing about. That is why religion is still so busy praying to a God who doesn't even know enough to know what they need until they tell it. Whereas, actually, God is the all-knowing mind and is the divine love unto our experience, but withheld from us not by itself, but by our inability to penetrate to it. 
just as Jesus Christ could not have uh, iceless refrigeration, although it's right there now on the spot where he was born, but he couldn't have it because there was no one in the world who could at that time penetrate into the realm where the secret of electricity and electric power was to be found. It was always within their own being, but there was no one to penetrate that realm. In the same way that when he needed transportation, he sent outside for a jackass. But right now, in the place where that jackass was, is an airfield. Why? Because somebody penetrated the withinness of their own consciousness and came forth with the secrets of uh, air travel. Where did the Wright brothers find all that? In their consciousness. They went within and they brought into the without the secrets of air travel. So it is. The Christ, the fourth dimension of life, is an area of your own consciousness. It and all of its activities, functions, qualities, characteristics, nature, is within you. And it is when you get up in the middle of the night or early in the morning before the rest of the family is up and find your peace and quiet that you can turn within and say, I know there is an outer me sitting here, but I also know there is an inner me. I also know there is a divine presence. I know the whole power and presence of God is right here where I am. I know that the kingdom of God is within my own being and I know that I must be still enough and silent enough to let it come forth into expression. And then you see, you do away with the need for those aspirin tablets. And as the realization deepens, you gradually find dependence on persons, things, circumstances, and conditions dropping away and dropping away and dropping away until regardless of what the need may be, there is a depth of consciousness that will reveal it. You see, this uh, spiritual consciousness has depths. If you touch it lightly on the surface, you can very easily uh, overcome colds, grip, flu, little lack or limitation or lonesomeness, but you'd have to go far deeper than that to work out your problem of uh, supply. I don't mean just today's supply, but I mean a, the realization of omnipresence of infinite supply. You'll have to go deeper than on the surface. The same way as uh, to uh, overcome the deeper problems of life, you have to go far deeper than the surface of this consciousness it is, as it has been said in one of the ancient wisdoms, that the best pearls are the deepest down in the sea. And only the divers who can go the deepest can get the best pearls. And so it is in spiritual wisdom and illumination, only those capable of going deeper and deeper and deeper into their own inner being achieve the fuller measures of Christhood, just as in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Master had to reach down to the very, very bottom of the ocean to bring forth the ability to be resurrected and to make the ascension. You can be assured he was in torture trying to reach the depth of that. That was why he probably felt he wasn't going to make it and asked the disciples to stand by at least for one hour to lend their spiritual support to his so that he could get down just a little bit deeper to bring forth this uh, impossible demonstration. So it is with us. 
We look to each other for help in bringing forth the deeper manifestations or evidences of the Spirit. And we have that right. Not that we are looking to each other as persons, we are looking to the degree of realized Christ that each other has. And sometimes where two or more are gathered together, there is a greater evidence of that spirit than would otherwise be the case. You know already that that is true because you already know that when you come into these meetings you find a deeper evidence and uh, realization of the Christ that when, than when you are alone in your own home. That must inevitably be. It could not be otherwise. We are here for one purpose. There isn't a selfish motive in this whole room. No one is trying to get anything from anyone else. Therefore, this whole atmosphere and consciousness is one of purity. Whatever we are seeking, we are seeking not of each other, but of this transcendental Christ. So you already have uh, a group of uh, people representing spiritual purity. Then further than that, we are by virtue of our studies more in our unitedness than we are in our separateness. And uh, that the Master gave evidence to when he took his 12, 11 disciples for his experience, when he took the other disciples with him to the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, I said this is repetition, but you see the purpose of it. Because the continuous coming here which acts in the same way that the continuous study of the writings or hearing of the recordings. All of this is an enrichment of consciousness and making it possible for us to go deeper. But the experience itself still is an individual one. And if you are not practicing it in your own home, it is as if you were walking around this earth just as uh, your own self. Rather, than developing a consciousness of another presence or power within which will never leave you nor forsake you. And that, you see, has to be an individual experience. It has to begin in the morning because it is such a foolish thing to do anything during the day, even starting out in the morning, of our own wisdom, of our own power, of our own strength, when... Uh, by virtue of a 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 minute resting in the spirit, we can bring forth more Menahunis than uh, Hawaii ever had. Now, it isn't sufficient to accomplish that in the morning and let it go for the rest of the day because there is a pressure from without a world pressure that is produced by the headlines, by the radio news, by the occurrences all over the world, which, even though we are not conscious of it, acts as a mesmeric force to separate us from our realization of that presence. You do not yet know the operation of this mental force that is in the world by virtue of men's beliefs. You cannot imagine, except when you realize, for instance, what has happened many times in theaters when somebody yelled fire and then saw how just, there may have been no fire or it may have been a small insignificant one, but that cry of fire froze everyone. It acted as a state of hypnotism and made people do the things that in their ordinary senses they would never have been guilty of. Now, we do not hear the cry of fire. We're not aware of it. But it is being voiced. 
by all those who are in fear whether they're in fear of communism or whether they're in fear of Huns or whether they're in fear of Jews or whether they're in fear of a depression whatever they may be in fear of they are crying fire in their hearts and that cry goes out into this invisible world and we do not know what hits us we only know we have a sense of separation from God of futility and we think it's our fault it is only our fault in that we have not renewed our conscious relationship with that Christ our conscious realization of that Christ if we renewed it a dozen times a day then uh, these mesmeric influences of the world would not touch us then we could say none of these things move me or who convinceth me of sin then you could never be moved because you'd have yourself so established in your spiritual wisdom in your Christhood that you could not be moved by appearances do you see that but that is something that each one must attain for themselves and not only attain but maintain does the time ever come when we can relax from that and the answer is no as time goes on we have to intensify it the master couldn't relax even at the time of the crucifixion and the resurrection if he has relaxed it was after the ascension and if there is a time for relaxing from this it will be after our ascension although we may not have to pass on to make that ascension but so far as is known no one has attained it this side now here is a world let's say I started by saying that here is a room and all of a sudden somebody has a headache in it and so the rest of us are called upon to accept the responsibility to realize the Christ the activity presence and power the spirit of the Christ because where the presence of that spirit is there is liberty so wherever there's a realization of that presence the headache must be dispelled every headache and foot ache and leg ache and stomach ache in this room and in all the rooms where the recordings are being heard must be dispelled by the conscious realization of the activity and presence of the Christ first of all by some one individual in that room and eventually by every individual in that room it should eventually be that in uh, groups like this that within one or two or three months there shouldn't really be a serious problem in the whole room or in the experience of anybody in the room I mean a, a problem of their own being that doesn't mean that all their family problems will be solved because that involves the demonstration of other people but so far as problems which concern our own being a month or two or three of this kind of work dedicated only to the realization of the Christ should result in every one of us being shall we call it 99 percent free of the thoughts and things of the world or 98 or 95 or 92 all of which would be good demonstration and it can be it should be because there is a sufficiency of realized Christ to meet these needs and more especially as a second one a third one a fourth one and a fifth one begin to attain this conscious realization of the Christ it should benefit all of us now then that is not the goal of our work the goal of our work is proving this principle because if we prove it 
by my becoming free of 90% of the world's problems and then one or two or three of you and ultimately all of you becoming free then uh, does the question not arise ah but in the house next door there is a headache and on the street below us there's a cancer and consumption and polio and uh, in the community next to us is the fear of war and in the country next to us is the fear of atomic bombs do you not see now that every man becomes our neighbor every nation every country becomes our responsibility and as this Christ becomes a realized experience we not only are meeting our own headaches but the headaches of friends of relatives finally of neighbors finally of the people down the street and around the corner and in this wise and only in this wise will the problems of life be solved the introduction of the transcendental thing called Christ alone will meet the problems of the world you see we could take uh, the League of Nations and watch it break up after World War One, and then say why did it break up because the man who was the source of it the creator of it the founder of it was in spite of all his worldly ignorance at least an honest man and the answer is that the League of Nations could never function on any higher level than the mind of the humans that formed it and they were all politicians and they were all so-called statesmen which is a very refined word for a very ugly thing now the same is true of the United Nations it can never function on any higher level than the mind that makes that constitutes it what is the mind that constitutes it well its primal uh, idea is that if anyone doesn't like anything that the rest want just veto it so it can't rise any higher than the veto never never no matter how many wonderful things are embodied in the United Nations it can never rise higher than the veto because as soon as somebody doesn't like what all the rest like it's vetoed so you see it can't really operate for peace it can only operate for peace if it doesn't interfere with the activity or thought of someone who has the power to veto it and it doesn't mean that always there will necessarily be one power doing the vetoing now if by any chance there should be changes made in uh, those organizational laws rules of the United Nations it still will only function on the level of those who form a majority and the majority may one day be good and one day be evil now when the transcendental factor enters human consciousness then whether it's United Nations or League of Nations then it becomes an instrument of good then it becomes the human activity for the mind that is now functioning in it and that mind is Christ or spiritual good I hope you can follow this point that no organizational activity can ever be better than the mind that at the moment is ruling it and that nothing can change that except the activity of the Christ you can take that down to individual experience too and uh, say that your bookkeeping cannot be any more accurate than the bookkeeper who runs your books or that your bookkeeping can't be any more honest than the honesty of your bookkeeper 
So the only way to improve uh, the physical activity of your bookkeeping is to improve the nature of your bookkeeper's consciousness. So it is with every factor of life. Here we have people, human beings in this room, made up of a composite of good and evil. You don't know how much evil there is in this room of humans because you do not yet know what evil they would release if uh, self-interest should sufficiently demand it. You know the strongest power there is on earth, human power, is self-preservation. People have been known to kill for it. People have been known to fight to the death for it. People have been known to rob, steal, cheat, defraud for something that involved their own self-preservation. And uh, all human nature is made up of that. It isn't always expressed. It doesn't always come to light. Because what one person won't do for money, they might do uh, for the saving of their life or human sense of life. What they might do or might not do for the protection of their own uh, self, they might do for the protection of their child or their parent. And so nobody knows the depth of depravity that lies inherent in even uh, good human people until you come to see them under stress and uh, strain. None of this can be eliminated by any desire to be a good person or to conform to the Ten Commandments or the Sermon on the Mount. This change can only be brought about by the introduction into consciousness of uh, the Christ. When the Christ touches an individual's soul, they cannot be made to lie, cheat, or defraud for any purpose of themselves or their parents or their children or their nation. No human being has such a gift of goodness. Only the achievement of the Christ can make a person rise to where they're willing to lay down their own life for their neighbor's good, where they are willing to give up their own supply for their neighbor's supply. No human being ever can become that good. Only an activity of the Christ realized can bring forth such a life of impersonal devotion, not to people, but to the principle of good. Now, When you have experience with an active practice or student body and you get to see many, many, many people struggling to be better humans than they are or to be more successful humans than they are or happier humans than they are and see how fruitless all their efforts are until that invisible thing touches them, then you will know why it is important to practice this until it is achieved. If you could see the hopelessness in uh, the prisons and the hospitals and the mental institutes of anything that is at present at their command to help the situation, you would know right well how important it is that some uh, group of people in the world began to attain uh, the achievement of the fourth dimensional consciousness, the Christ, the Spirit of God that makes men free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But quoting that won't do it. It has to be the realization and achievement of it that does it. There is a Christ. And Christ is localized, if we may use that word, because we know where it is. It is within you, wherever that may be. At least it is within range of your attainment. It is within range of our ability to achieve and to experience. But it isn't easy. The Master says, the way is straight and narrow and few there be that enter. 
There's the reason. Here I am, a human being. And of myself, I have no powers to do anything of any worthwhile nature. And yet, all of this time, locked up within my being, is that which multiplied loaves and fishes, raised the dead, healed the sick, comforted the mourner. And so it is, and I've learned this by long experience. I've had much experience with people who have mourned. I've learned that no matter what words I can say to them or what beautiful letters I can compose, it is cold and lifeless and does nothing for them unless from the depths of the within something invisible comes forth to touch them and then it makes no difference what is said or written. The least message, the smallest message, the most seemingly innocuous message seems to bring healing, comforting, salvation. And not because of the combination of words but because of that invisible and often intangible something that we call the Christ. Our work in the message of the infinite way from this point on, I mean from the point of this Kailua study group series, is the actual achievement, attainment, realization of the Christ. We have enough of the letter of truth and all of the writings and other recordings. Now we must, not only those in this room but those that are listening to the tapes, must constitute themselves committees of one. First of all for their own salvation since nothing is going to bring ultimate peace, safety, security except the attainment of the realization of the Christ. And secondly, for the benefit of families, communities, and ultimately, the world itself. When there is an activity of the Christ in human consciousness, men will be governed by the activity of the Christ and not by personal motives, not even by patriotic motives, not even by church motives. It is just as evil to do a thing for one's church as it is to do it for one's country. If it sets up any benefit for that church or country separate and apart from the benefit of the world. Men call it patriotism. They call it dying for their own religion, martyrdom. It isn't a sin. It's sin whenever the motive is personal. Whenever the motive is for separation and division. Now, to belong to federations and world brotherhoods is all of no avail. No avail as long as a world brotherhood still believes that a Jew is a Jew and a Protestant is a Protestant and a Catholic is a Catholic, they cannot achieve this purpose. I don't mean that we should be interested in breaking them up because they are a step on the way. But their benefit can only come when a brotherhood says there is but one father and therefore all men are brothers. Therefore our interests are all the same as if we were one family. That can never come through human nature because the first law of human nature is self-preservation at anybody else's expense. It is only as spiritual nature enters the picture. The actual attainment and realization of the Christ. And so as we go into meditation please remember this that even if we go into meditation just being a selfhood alone, that when we come out of meditation, there must be the realization that there are two. And this won't make duality, because it really won't be two. It'll be that we have attained the realization of our inner self, our Christ self, our inner being. And it still will be one, I and the Father 
are one. Even with that word and in there, it is still only one. And so when we achieve the realization of this inner presence, there won't be two of us here. There will only be one, but there will be the one now with the attainment of the realization of his actual fourth dimension of life.